There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello, BookTube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel and welcome back to another episode of Zooming In, which is a new series on my channel where I interview bookish social media luminaries about book-related literary articles online. And oh my God, can you say luminary, boys and girls? This is Kate from one of my very most favorite book podcasts. The podcast is called The Book Club Review Podcast. Kate, I am honored. Welcome. Thank you. It was worth coming on just to hear myself described as a, a bookish luminary. I'm going to play that back to myself whenever I'm feeling like I need a little kick. And I have to say, if you play back me describing you as a bookish social media luminary for a pick-me-up, I feel not so shy about admitting to you but sometimes all I have time to listen to is your theme music, and it gives me a pick-me-up. I love your theme music. Hello, and welcome to the Book Club Review. I'm Kate. Can you tell us about it? Where, where did you get it? So do I. It was composed for us wow. by my friend Nick. I used to work in book publishing. And he was someone I work with. He's a designer. But on the side, his side hustle is that he is a musician, you know, kind of proper, like, in a band. But they compose music for music libraries. And uh, and anyone who's ever tried to, looked into, like, licensing music or has looked, wanted to do something and needed music, you'll know how expensive it can be. And I was getting a bit stuck with this. You know, we needed music and we couldn't afford to pay the rights for the a, a music that we had that we originally started the show with which I also loved very much but that was just getting really expensive and we don't make any money on the podcast so that was a bit it was just getting a bit ridiculous <laughs> and so I emailed him and I was like Nick you know all this music you make for music libraries is there any chance you make I actually said is there anything you've got that we could use and and he sent me all these different things that he'd done but nothing was quite right um and then he, he he did say he did offer he's like you know would you like me to have a look at coming up with something for you and then that was so the music we have now it's kind of inspired by our original track which we really love but it's i love the that it's yeah it's its own thing now viewers and listeners you've been treated to it and uh now you can listen to it when you need to put me up but more more than that the podcast is just incredible. Kate has just got a knack for this kind of thing. I think she should be doing it full time. Oh, you're so nice to say. Let's not forget that Kate co-hosts the Book Club Review podcast with the wonderful Laura, who's a Canadian. And she's not on as much as she used to be, but she's wonderful too. She's still involved. She's still very involved, only because I refuse to let her go, basically. I'm like, I cannot do this without you. Um, yeah, she's just really busy. She's got a very demanding full-time job and she's got a four-year-old daughter and it's just a lot going on. So we we had to really think about, well, how can we make it so that it's sustainable for her? You know, I have, I'm lucky I have a bit more time than she does. Um, so that was the way we kind of tried to figure it out was what are the shows that she can drop in and do so she can kind of still do the book club shows. She's happy to do the bookshelf shows. It's really just all the other stuff I do that she used to be pulled into that now. I just do on my own. So we're here. Kate and I are here to talk about an article. It's called In Loving Memory of the Books I'll Never Read Again. And the author is Cole Rush. This was published just a couple of weeks ago on the website Tor.com, which Kate has just informed me is actually a sci-fi and fantasy publishing company. Nice. They also have articles on their website, and this is one of them. And Cole Rush talks in this article about why they don't reread stuff, especially books they loved in, from their youth. And also talks about some experiences where they regretted rereading books from their youth. So we're not going to limit ourselves in this discussion to books from our childhood, but rereading, yay or nay, how much do you do? Let's just get started with that question, Kate. Yeah, well, it was such a nice article, I thought, because it tapped into a really lovely sense of reflection and nostalgia and kind of that that place that books have 
you know, not only when we've just read them and we're all excited about them and we're talking about them, but then when they settle into our memories and, and particularly formative reading, you know, those are the things that made us who we are. As an author, Francis Spufford, who wrote a nonfiction book called The, the Child That Books Built, I think was the title. Yeah. And it's that idea that, you know, his reading really shaped him as a person, but it does everybody, you know, I think every person is shaped by the books that they read in childhood. So I just, I like the way the article brought that up and kind of made me think about that in some nice way. Have you had good or bad experiences rereading some of your much loved books from your youth? I mean, it made me think, you know, I am, I have a blessing and a curse, which is, I just have a really terrible memory. So it's a curse because it's just awful. Like I can't remember people's names. I'm really bad at remembering like things. <laughs> it's just very troublesome. Um, uh, and I have a lot of kind of quite complicated strategies that help me remember things. One of which actually is a podcast. You know, it's great because then I can just dip back and, and, oh yeah, I thought this about this book. That's really helpful. But the blessing, of course, is that you read things and then you forget them. And then I remember this, you know, I remember in childhood, I remember the pleasure of reading something, loving it, putting it on my shelf and knowing that in two or three years I could come back to it and I wouldn't remember how it ended. I still have this with Georgia. Um, Laura and I often talk about Georgia Hare novels. She wrote this whole series, probably about 20 books, Regency romances. We're always very sniffy about Bridgerton because we feel like Bridgerton is a very poor imitation of, of the, you know the genius of Georgia hair novels but the thing is they're all different they all have sort of similar um things going on in them but they are all different and the characters are all different and I can't remember and so every so often I'll come across one that I haven't read for a few years and I'll just read it so happily because I've got no clue how things work out you forget and that's so in a way for, for a reader I think that's quite nice yes it is the thing that I forget the fastest about a book is the ending. I often forget mm. the ending, but can remember everything up until then because the ending is typically short and I read it and then I'm done and I, it hasn't, yeah, it's what, it's what fades. Characters' names fade. The most. Yeah. I also, I've got children and so I'm quite lucky in that children are, are just a brilliant prompt for revisiting things that you loved. And I think, uh, and someone uh, in the article, actually in the comments talks about this, they talk about how they basically felt like they had great taste as a child and that when they go back to things they read, you know, pretty much they still like them. And I, I felt a bit the same. I'm like, yeah, I think I was, you know, pretty selective and the things I tended to love were good. <laughs> That's why I love them. <laughs> and so when I go back to them, they're still good. I was thinking about, um, I thought, well, what are a few examples of that? Watership Down by Richard okay. Adams. I read with my girls probably before they were ready for it because it's quite full on Watership Down. There's quite a lot of trauma and disaster that befalls these poor rabbits and sort of difficult conversations about <laughs> why they're all dying left, right and centre. But oh my God, the writing is so amazing and the story is so powerful and just epic and it's all in there and it's fantastic. It is an absolutely fantastic read. And I think that totally holds up. Charlotte's Web, you know, every line is just a kind of tiny miracle. And and how amazing that, you know, this book exists and and, and I read it and loved it when I was young and, and now my children can read it. Um, some things, I think some things date in a way that's a bit unhelpful. I haven't reread any Enid Blyton, who was my favorite writer when I was a kid, because I'm mm. pretty sure that I will not get along with a lot of that you know, whatever, what is it, racial, racialized characterizations and so on that I don't remember, but that everybody is talking about. So that will probably turn me off of her. So I don't, I don't want to, I don't need to reread her. But then you say that, but we, um, there was one of her books called The Magic Faraway Tree. Oh, I love that. But you know what's so weird, but actually still quite good. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's just so nuts. And you know also what she was brilliant at? She was really brilliant at writing about food. So food in Enid Blyton's books, uh, it's, I don't know whether it's maybe kind of writing from some point of kind of post-war deprivation, which is would be very understandable, yes. but the, the meals all have this fantastic quality of just kind of like richness to them. You know, they're often quite simple, but it'd be 
thickly buttered bread and and and, and milk with cream and 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 you know mother had made a jam roly poly or whatever and it's all really simple but it, you just your mouth waters because she she was so brilliant the way she wrote about food so I'd say there are some things that you know that that don't go away that's, that, that's interesting you know, well then I will and if it goes badly I have you to blame I mean all I would say is it is a bit it's quite weird <laughs> with my youngest I was reading um, this book uh, Harold and the Purple Crayon. Did you read this it. as a child? This I don't classic. never heard of it. It's so good. And it's so kind of like strange. He he basically it's decided that he draws the world as he goes along. And so oh, lovely. Sort of looking at um ideas of perspective and but then it kind of gets quite 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 worrying because he basically has drawn himself into this world and then he can't find his way home. And he's That's forgotten great. how to get back and and he draws modernist. He exactly. He draws windows, and none of them is the right window. And then he draws a city, and and he can't find his house anywhere. And you're just like, what's going to happen? And then he remembers. He remembers how the moon looked through his bedroom window, and then he draws his bedroom window. And in this brilliant kind of like you know slightly metaphysical twist at the end, he's back in his own room in his own bed and it's just like it's so good <laughs> well and i don't think anybody's going to object to the spoiler you just gave us that sounds wonderful so was that a book that you read as a child as well yeah and i and, so and i do that i i will seek out or i have i have sought out books for them that i loved another one i i haven't got it's around here somewhere but i can't quite think where it's another classic that's totally out of print now it's called um the quangle wangle's hat and it's a poem by Edward Lear, and but it's il illustrated by an illustrator called Helen Oxenbury. And her illustrations are so fantastic. It's the most perfect, wonderful book. And you can get them. You have to just get it sort of secondhand. And they're quite expensive secondhand copies, but it's worth it. It, it totally. And that's a picture book that for me, like really held up. I was like, oh, yeah, this is so good. <laughs> There's one, have... another one, which is in the same category, which is called Phoebe and the Hot Water Bottles which I had similar feelings about. I had remembered it and I had thought about seeking it out. And actually another mum had said to me that she had got acquired a copy. And apparently that doesn't hold up, mainly because I think it's quite problematic. I think it's all quite dangerous. And uh, I don't know if she ends up setting the house on fire or something happens that really isn't good. So maybe that's an example of one that doesn't work. I have one to show you and I'm dying to know if you know it been thinking about this book for the last 10 15 years it just keeps coming back into my memory and i couldn't find a, an affordable used copy that was in good condition and i found my original copy in a box on my parents farm just a few weeks ago so mm. it's a children's novel from the uk and i'm really looking forward to rereading it and finding out does it does it stand up because like you were saying i don't remember much about it just that i really loved it mm. the greatest gresham by jillian I, avery right no, I don't know that at all. Never heard of it. Um, Victorian? How old is it? Let's see. No, 1962. Hmm. I would have read it in the 70s, and this was the copy I read. My grandparents made me wow. a library stamp, library of Sean oh, Mooney. Oh, you had a library stamp? That's I amazing. did. Wow. It's on the side, and uh, I belong to a book in the mail club, and here's all the people that read it. Oh and their goodness. ages what so it would get sent from person to person person to person in saskatchewan in That's my so province cool. of saskatchewan yeah so i'm gonna reread it and uh, see how it goes and... well uh, well perhaps we should pause a moment and say should you maybe well exactly risk, but, but isn't it? this one doesn't feel risky because i don't remember i just remember that i loved it it's not going to destroy me if i don't because it wasn't like an absolute favorite. You could do one of those crying videos if it does. You know, I could do one of those like crying it. videos, and that would <laughs> that would have to be on Patreon, I think. Sobbing over the book. It's not <laughs> as good as I remember. Well, I've got one. I also found one, which is from my childhood, which is a, a book I love that I think perhaps they don't hold up quite so well. This is uh, What Katie Did at School. By Susan Coolidge. So she, her most famous book was What Katie Did. I was given a copy of it because my name is Kate. And I 
remember I haven't reread what Katie did, but I did read it a lot when I was younger. And the thing about Katie, my children would she'd just drive them crazy. She's quite and the thing about Katie is that at the beginning of the book, she's sort of a bit selfish and um just thinks everything revolves around her. But I think there is something that's really sad that's happened, like the mum has died or something and you know, this whole family's been through this big trauma, but nothing none of that's really referred to. <laughs> Maybe I'm misremembering that. I can't remember. But, but 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 what I do remember is that Katie has an accident and she hurts her back and she can't walk and she has to lie in bed. And I, I think there is some question about whether she's ever going to be able to walk again. But but or maybe we know that she will. But but, you know, she just has to have this bed rest. And so the point is that she has to just stay in bed. She's incredibly grumpy about it. She just has a really terrible time. She's really depressed. And her her aunt, Aunt Helen, comes to see her. And Aunt Helen brings her just lovely things, beautiful things, and reads to her and gradually teaches Katie kind of how to be a better person. She has to learn that, that to become the heart of the home and that people, if, she, if she's all sort of lovely and nice, people will want to come and be with her and spend time with her. And I suppose she sort of learns to appreciate the people around her and life and her family and, and take joy in what she does have rather than just, you know, being grumpy about all the things that she's lost. So there's a real lesson in it. And 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 as a child, I, I didn't think too much of it and, and, and just sort of enjoyed the story. I think if I tried to read it now, I think Katie would really grate on me and the whole thing would just seem really like moralistic and, and over the top. But this book I loved even more, which is when Katie then recovers and she goes off to school and she goes off to boarding school with her sister Clover. Look at that illustration. Wow. Isn't that just fantastic? So beautiful. They go off to boarding school and they meet this wonderful girl who lives in the room, who has the room next door, whose name is Rose. Rose Red, can that be right? I think maybe Katie calls her Rose Red. And she's everything that they're not, you know, they're a bit sort of timid and full of decorum. And I think their father's a vicar or something like that and very prim and proper. And she's just completely free and easy and vivid and lively and so there's this lovely dynamic where she kind of works her magic on them and gets them to kind of unbutton a bit that's what I remember and again I would be a bit worried about reading it I, would it hold up I'm not sure I haven't tried it but definitely it's a book that I love that I kind of I wouldn't want to tamper with the the sort of place it, <laughs> it has in my heart yeah exactly one I that did stand up and I don't know why I didn't think of this until just now Anne of Green Gables I reread it. Like, um, I never read Anne of Green Gables. Well, you're excused for geographical reasons. It's but pretty bad, though, isn't it? That's a really fundamental classic. It's but... so good. It's so I good like as an it. adult. Do you think I should, go, so yeah, good. Maybe I should go back to it? I watched a bit of Anne with an E, and it seemed great. So then that made me feel, feel like, oh. My, and Anne with an e my is... best friend growing up, she was obsessed with the Anne of Green Gables book. She loved them so much. Um, and Anne with an E, as you probably know, is like it's outside of whatever was in any of the books. It's just it's oh, the characters. It? Oh, I thought that lines. was the story. Uh. I think I'm right. I know I'm at least partially right. They they may have fooled around with the storylines, but I know I think it's all completely just an extension of the story, not actually based on any of the books. It does hold up, does it? I thought it was a re it was a wonderful piece of literature, and the character was so vibrant, and just jumped off the page. Yeah. He's wonderful. And then thinking about, you know, this idea in the article, isn't it, is, is about books that you don't want to read them because for whatever reason, maybe you don't want to risk spoiling the feeling that you had about them. Another very good example, which someone cited in the comment actually comments actually was The Road by Cormac McCarthy, which they said is the best book they'll never read again. And I feel okay. exactly the same way, like glad I read it profound impact on me never want to read it again but there's one book that is about to come out uh by uh, V.E. Schwab who wrote the Invisible Life of Addie LaRue very famously she also wrote this series of books this trilogy A Darker Shade of Magic A Gathering of Shadows and A Conjuring of Light and I came across them. I had read Ali LaRue and quite liked it, but I just wanted to read something else. I didn't sort of love it, but I liked it enough to want to read something else by her. And I idly picked up one of these books because I like fantasy. And uh, I thought, oh, great, now I'll read these. And I fell 
for this trilogy so hard. I just loved it so much. You know, my life could be very boring. And I spent a lot of time just like looking after small children and 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 not going out, not really doing anything, not seeing people. Like long stretches of my life are just not much going on. And these books just were such um maybe also it was a bit sort of COVID time as well. And there was something I was really just like wanting to just escape from. Anyway, I just fell into this world so happily. I love these characters so much. I lived and breathed. She's such a brilliant writer as well. She's so good. So often fantasy, um, it feels like it's it's sort of maybe uh, they've thought a lot about the world building, but they haven't really thought that much about the characters and and they they don't really have a lot of depth. You know, maybe they do a thing or they they some event happens or whatever, but the actual character, like who are they? What makes the light, kind of light and shade of them? That's what I want, you know, in any kind of book, but just as much in a fantasy book as anything else. And she does that absolutely brilliantly. I think she's so great. And so these characters are so good. Anyway, it was a really perfect trilogy. I just loved the way it, it, it went on a really interesting arc. She ended it beautifully, and that's not easy. You know, a lot about how good a book is, I think, is how the author ends it, wraps it up. And I thought she just did this perfect ending. I loved it. It was sort of closed, but at the same time open and allowed me to sort of travel on with these characters in my imagination, which I just loved, even as I felt bereft. I have read them not once, not twice, not three times. I've read them more times than that. I really love these That's books. Fabulous. Hilariously, I recommended them to Laura. I was like, oh, you have to read these books. And I don't think, I think she's a bit like, oh, I'm not sure they're for me. She was a bit kind of like, why does Kate like these so much? Anyway, she's got a new one coming out in a week and a half. It's a follow on. I believe it's a little bit later in time. It's called The Fragile Threads of Power. I follow her on Instagram. She's been teasing little snippets from it for, for months and months and months. And yet, I mean, I, 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 you know, I kind of have it pre-ordered. I, I am going to get it. But a big part of me is like, should I read it? What if it, you know, dis disrupts my love for these books? Another good example for that actually is Lonesome Dove by Larry McMurtry. I went on a big Lonesome Dove adventure last summer. I read it. I absolutely loved Remember? it. I lived and breathed it. I know I am not alone. You know, most people I think who read Lonesome Dove have this sort of response to it. It's a very, you know, it's a book that really grabs you by the heart, won't let you go. But I very consciously and deliberately did did not want to read any of the subsequent books set in that world because I just was like, no this was the book this was perfect i i don't want to in any way disrupt how i felt about this book so i i, I never did i just heard an identical conversation about this exact set of books with that exact opinion expressed on a recent episode of the mooks and the gripes podcast ah. between paul and trevor and basically yeah. that was the conversation they had about it so and what did they decide did they read on or did they did they leave it they were hesitating or one of them was. I've forgotten the details, but the 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 reservations that you just expressed were exactly that what, what uh, I think it was Trevor said. So that book is coming my way, and I do not know if I'll read it. I may just put it on the shelf. Just having it, it may be enough. <laughs> and it it'll jump off the shelf when the time is right. That's that's yeah. what I think. I mean, yeah. Uh, one thing's for sure I have to stop reading the original trilogy because I'm just going to read it out that will be the other thing you know you read something too much you just get to a point where you just see through it and then you don't you don't enjoy it anymore and I can't do that so I have to stop reading them hey, pacing the two books I'll talk about before we close one is the book that I have reread the most at least mm. in my adult life A Month in the Country by J.L. Oh. Carr it was you, you, do you know that book I do I've never read it but I've seen the film which I loved okay and it's, mm. uh, I guess it's one of my very most favorite books because I, I reread it about every two years. Mm. And I just, I read it, I read it for the third time, my second reread um, in some earlier this year and love it more every time. Mm. And my favorite novel that I've read in my entire life is Do Not Say We Have Nothing by Madeline Tien. Wow. That's a long it one. It was on the Women's Prize that year and i think it won canadian uh, governor general's award i have mm. read that book and uh, are you so 
well, I'm going to ask you for your opinion in a minute, but I don't want, I don't think I want to reread it. It was such a profound experience that I just worry that I might not, because I've heard so, this is where I'm going to ask for your opinion. I've heard so many people that, that didn't like it. It's such a Marmite book. And I've heard nothing but bad things about it yeah. ever since <laughs> I put it down that I don't want to try it again. But I, my memory of it is, is just a beautiful thing that I, that I protect. And I don't, I'd expect now when anybody tells me they've read it, that they didn't like it. Yeah, I know you didn't like it. <laughs> Not surprised, but I loved it. Mm. Did you like it? I loved it too. Um, oh, although I, I can see why people struggle and I certainly did struggle. You know, it's not it's not an easy read, but it, it, it has this absolutely profound message at its heart and you are changed by it. Right. You are not the same person when you finish that book that you were when you began it and it leaves you with something. So I actually can't really remember. It's been a while. We did it for the podcast. We did it for the book club and I've forgotten a lot of the details but what I haven't for, what I haven't forgotten is the kind of like the journey it took me on and and what I learned from it and 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 that that then now is part of what makes me me you know and that's what that's what you want isn't it it's these books that that have something in them whether you encounter them in childhood or or in later life and they and they they change you they leave you they, they leave their mark on you and so even though you move on and you might forget them they're still a part of you. Let's end right there. That is the beautiful way to end this incredible conversation. Kate, thank you so much. Oh, pleasure. Anytime. What, what a treat.